Hey everyone, welcome. Glad you are joining us. Sorry about the Facebook issues. We were having some trouble going live, but glad you were able to make it into this Zoom room with us. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our special guests today. They may look familiar if you were with us yesterday and talk a little bit about what our program is gonna be like today. So this is our second student webinar on the attack on Pearl Harbor, and we are again joined by two educators from Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, Melissa and Ford. Hey guys. Uh -huh. hey. And we are going to watch the second clip from our Pearl Harbor Manhattan, oh, Pearl Harbor um, electronic field trip. And then we are going to again turn it over to Ford and Melissa to tell us a little bit more about the museum, but also what it was like to be in Hawaii during and after the attack. And they're going to share some more resources with us. And then we're going to take more Q&A questions. And again, so you can type those if you are in the room, you'll see um, the Q&A and the chat function. You can use those to type questions in. So thank you so much for being with us here. And again, apologize for the technical difficulties and working with us. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started by playing our Pearl Harbor electronic field trip. And then we'll turn it over to Ford and Melissa in the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. Again, thanks for being with us. I'm back in New Orleans at the National World War II Museum in the Road to Tokyo Galleries. Here we're looking at some artifacts Ms. Chrissy pulled from the vault. Now Julia told me that the attack devastated Hawaii, but did it have a larger effect on the United States? Ileana, that's a fantastic question, and as you probably guess, it definitely did. This infamous day was felt by many Americans all across this country. They were listening to, you know, their regularly scheduled program on these radio broadcasts, and this news interrupts that radio broadcast. Or, as we actually even see here, these are some artifacts indeed from our vault. Um, and these are all major headlines that day about Japan uh, attacking the United States and the U.S. Uh, now at war. So here, um, closest to you, we see a newspaper from Chicago. Uh, next to me is actually a newspaper from a small town, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And of course, in the center here is a newspaper from New Orleans declaring that war. So something that uh, Americans felt all across this country that this day of infamy would live with many of them for the rest of their <laughs> lives. Now you say day of infamy a lot and we've heard it several times. So what does infamy mean? Ah, you see that's another really great question and we actually have used it quite a bit, haven't we? Uh, infamy uh, means me being famous for a negative reason and it's a great word because it's the same word that our president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uses in a famous speech uh, the day after the attack on Pearl Harbor. And in that speech, he is asking Congress to declare war on Japan. And actually, on the other side of you, we have a copy of that speech. Now, it's not the final speech. You can see there's some edits to it from Roosevelt himself. But can you look there and see what, what's the first sentence on there? What does it say? It says, yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in world history world history and then you can see above though he scratched out uh, world history and wrote infamy so why do you think he would change his words well he knew it was a speech that was important in american history so he wanted to get his point across kind of like the lincoln's gettysburg address exactly going to war was a big step for a country thousands of people were killed in a surprise attack a truly terrible act Calling Japan's attack infamous set the tone for his request, and it proved to be true. Congress almost unanimously declared war on Japan. Now, at the end of 1941, America was finally dragged into the world war that China and Japan had been fighting since 1937, and much of Europe had been in since 1939. In the days after the attack, thousands of Americans joined the fight, signing up at recruiting centers across the country. Three days later, Germany and Italy, who were allied with Japan, declared war on the United States. For the next three and a half years, the U.S. would be committed to fighting and winning this global conflict. I see 
more posters. Exactly, yeah, I actually pulled some earlier from our vault. Earlier in the electronic field trip, our audience voted on what the uh, meaning of propaganda was. Do you remember that meaning? Propaganda is a tool used to convince or persuade people to act or believe in a certain way. Okay, you guys voted on which Pearl Harbor posters you wanted to see. Let's see how you voted. Looks like the students chose option B. Oh, perfect. This is another great propaganda poster. And actually, you know what? I'm going to take the back seat here and let you be the historian. Tell me what you see in that poster there. Well, it's very dark and dramatic, and there seems to be a sailor with his fist up like he's charging forward. And I think that's the USS Arizona exploding in the back. That's actually exactly right. And notice if you take a closer look at that sailor there, his sleeve is all tattered. What, what do you think that might mean? Well, it could mean that he might have been in the attack, and he looks very determined. Yeah, very good. I think you're exactly right. Now, there's another really good vocabulary term in that poster. It says avenge December 7th. What do you think avenge means? Well, avenge kind of sounds like revenge, so it could mean that the U.S. was getting back at Japan for the attack on Pearl Harbor. Exactly. Man, I couldn't analyze it any better myself. Great job, Ileana. So I hear a lot of avenge and remember. Yeah, you're exactly right to pick up on that. That was a common theme after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Posters actually like the one that we just analyzed uh, were spread across towns, communities, and cities all throughout World War II. And you know what? It wasn't just posters. I actually have some other great artifacts here from the museum's vault that say, you probably guessed it, Remember Pearl Harbor. So as you can see here, we've got this really neat comic book that says Remember Pearl Harbor with Uncle Sam charging at Japan. Um, there were also uh, buttons and pins and trinkets. And so these sweetheart pins, which are actually pins given by those loved ones far away at home, uh, from home at the war, they would send these to their loved ones here on the home front saying, I remember you and I miss you and I'm thinking about you. And so the common themes with those is remember Pearl Harbor, never forget. And you can see some of them are pretty elaborate and pretty beautiful. Wow, if the response was this great on the mainland, I wonder what it was like back in Hawaii. Let's see what Julia's up to. Right now, I'm at Theodore Roosevelt High School on Oahu with Jimmy. Roosevelt High was here 75 years ago, and the place changed a lot in the months after the attack. Check this out. Many seniors in the high school joined the military. Several students who went to Roosevelt were even killed during World War II. They are honored with this plaque in front of the school. Their names are read by students to this day. So Jimmy, when did you return to school after the attack, and how did school life change? You know, I was not at this school before, but I went to a school called IA, mm -hmm. and that's near my home. But, you know, right after the attack, the school was closed. It was used for a hospital. Wow. And therefore, I'm not sure exactly when I went back to school, but it was a long time. But during that time, you know, I would martial law. I mean, we, we, we just lived in fear. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the military took control. Yeah. And we had blackouts, we had rationing, we had censorship. And all the things that we used to do, you know, whether it was right, wrong, or indifferent, we had to do things the military way. And we lived like that for three years. Wow. You know, like going into the waters, you know, and that was a violation. Every time I did that, I got arrested. Uh, martial law was really something that disciplined us. We had, we could not say anything. The military took over parts of the school's administration building, the athletic fields, and the backyard. The school was even surrounded by barbed wire barricades. Students supported the war effort and joined the Victory Corps, a club that gathered scrap materials and sold war bonds to help pay for the war. You know, Julie, the students here were so patriotic. And you know, this school here, the students, they raised almost over $160,000. You know, buying war bonds and stamps and, and working in the pineapple fields. So schools, especially here in Hawaii, dramatically changed after the attack. Not only did their physical appearance alter with barbed wire and barricades, but the students helped the war effort in ways that they could. Many even enlisted in the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps, some never coming back from the battlefronts. 
Wow, there were so many powerful and moving primary sources that we talked about in that clip. And so I want to turn it now over to Ford and Melissa, who actually, their museum isn't a primary source because it's a World War II era hangar where that's where the center of Pearl Harbor occurred. And again, if you go to their museum, you can stand where the first bombs fell on that fateful day in 1941. But they're going to share some more primary sources and resources with us now. So Ford and Melissa, take it away. Aloha, everybody. Uh, my name is Ford Abesugawa, and um, I have some uh, photos I'd, I'd like to share with you. Uh, these photos are from um, the Hamilton Library archives uh, of the University of Hawaii, and they've been kindly gave us permission to utilize some of these photos um, to share with you. And let's see. So uh, we're talking about what happened to Hawaii uh, following the attack on Pearl Harbor. I think we've covered a lot about uh, what happened on that December 7th, but a lot of us don't know and, and realize the impact on Hawaii and its residents immediately following the attack. And, uh, and it impacted everybody from young and old alike. And I'm going to show you some Real interesting photos. First one, I think everybody recognizes, right? Uh, in the background, you have the iconic um, landmark of Diamond Head. And, you know, if you had removed those barbed wire, it would look like any other photo, even taken today. But along the, the coasts of Waikiki and across the coastlines of Hawaii, they put up barbed wire. And it's interesting to note that immediately following the attack, um, America didn't know what the intentions of the, of the Empire of Japan was, whether they intended to come back and invade Hawaii. So they had to take precautions. And one of those precautions were uh, installing barbed wire across the beaches to prevent any type of uh, landing by the Japanese. And um, interesting, um, we have not only adults wearing gas masks, but we have children and kids as young as seven were issued gas masks by the military government because martial law was in effect. And they were required to carry these gas masks on their person at all times. And in this photo, you can see that they're even holding a, a practice exercise for the possible attack, poison gas attacks and air raids that could occur on the islands. Symbolic of the contribution of public and private schools towards winning the war is the scene at Central Intermediate School. And this is a local school on Oahu. And most of the open spaces at schools, not only just Central, but all the other schools throughout the territory, formerly used for play, the open playgrounds and the uh, athletic fields were all converted into air raid shelters to serve not only the community and neighborhood, but the school children, school children as well. And you can see um, a couple of students coming out from underground in the, uh, that air, air raid shelter. And many of the school rooms were converted into first aid stations. And also a lot of schools were entirely taken over uh, by the military for military use. Here you can see uh, another school, and this is Liliokalani School. 
and the students are getting set for preparing for emergencies. And it wasn't uncommon where they would hold air raid drills. And unlike air raid shelters where it's a tunnel into the ground and you're hiding underground, these students were in what we call air raid trenches. And all it was was a trench dug into the ground about five, six feet, and the children would line up into that air raid trench for protection. And it wasn't uncommon where they would hold little training sessions to teach first aid techniques to the students. And here you can see the teacher as well as some of the older students practicing these first aid techniques while the younger students are hidden in those air raid trenches. You know, we're, we're familiar with um, recycling and repurposing, and that was also done back in the 1940s during the Second World War. Um, it, where we have a, a, aluminum recycling, it was done also for the war effort. And in this particular photo, we have some students from Kapalama Elementary School, and they're participating in an aluminum drive where people would turn in scrap aluminum uh, pots and pan, aluminum pots and pans that they were no longer using and donating it to this salvage drive so that this aluminum could be repurposed to build aircraft. And not just aluminum, but rubber was also very important. And uh, here is a photo of some boy and Cub Scouts uh, in, involved in a rubber drive where they're also collecting rubber, which was also critical for the war effort because this scrap rubber was repurposed to make gas masks, life rafts, and even more tires for our service members abroad. And in Mr. Lee, in the uh, video, um, they were at Roosevelt High School. And this photo, in fact, are Roosevelt High School students. And they're seated at a table. And what they're doing is they're cutting material for rebuilding children's gas masks. So everybody got involved in the war effort. Another thing uh, that was routine during the war was uh, rationing. And whether it was gasoline or food, the general civilian population had to make sacrifices. They had to do without so that a majority of the resources could go for the war effort and for the soldiers fighting abroad. And this is a, a classic example. Uh, Honolulu motorists in this picture, they're lined up outside City Hall to obtain gas rationing coupons. And these coupons are being issued by the city treasurer's office. And this is under the direction of the military authorities. And again, because this is martial law and Hawaii was under martial law for a number of years, and this coupon that they would obtain allows them to purchase 10 gallons of gasoline per month. Can you imagine that? You know, we may fill up our gas tanks 12 to 15 gallons a week, but people were limited to 10 gallons a month. This photo, uh, again, involves rationing. Uh, not only did they ration gasoline, but things, everyday items that we take for granted, like sugar, fresh meats, milk, cheese, eggs, and butter were some of the things that were rationed and you had to have special coupons 
coupon stamps and points in order to purchase these items. And this photo shows a group of civilians waiting in line at Central Market in Kaimuki on Oahu and um, to purchase their rationed share of foods. To supplement their food supplies, civilians were also encouraged to grow their own foods. And these were known commonly as victory gardens. And these victory gardens were all over the place, not only in Hawaii, but the mainland as well. And this allowed civilians to be able to grow additional foods for the dinner table and not have to rely too much on rationing. I really like this photo because um, it's a photo of uh, American soldiers and they have a machine gun emplacement on the beach and we call it Ala Moana Beach Park and Ala Moana Beach Park in on Oahu is a very popular beach park and it was back in the 1940s and it still is today. And again, you can see the barbed wire. And again, it was because uh, America did not know what Japan intended to do. And we had to prepare for a possible invasion of Hawaii. And this picture kind of says it all. And so the military pre presence on Oahu was massive. Um, Hawaii was pretty much a jumping off point for various locations throughout the Pacific during the, the course of the war. And a lot of sailors, soldiers, and Marines would go through Hawaii and they have fond memories of, of their time spent in Hawaii. And this USO hut is a classic example of how our military person personnel got around and were able to see the sites while they were spending their free time in Hawaii. And again, uh, I'd like to thank the Hamilton Library Archives at the University of Hawaii for the use of these photos. But I, I thank you guys for allowing me to share these photos with you. And please, if you have any questions, um, I'll try and answer them. Thank you. Thanks for those great. Um, we do have some more resources for you today. So I'm gonna go ahead and share those with you. All right, so here we have um, some more information about those media sources that we talked about in the video. And these would have been used to inform the American public about what was going on with the war effort, but also these home front activities that Ford was talking about and trying to get more people to participate in them. And so we have some more information. And then we also have a couple links so this first one is a link to a fireside chat that President Roosevelt gave about going to war with Japan. Um, so the fireside chats, if you're not familiar, President Roosevelt would use the radio to very simply and clearly speak to the American public to keep them updated on what was happening, but also to help kind of ease the fear and uncertainty that people were feeling at that time. And then we have another link here for one of those newsreels that was mentioned in the video also that you would have seen prior to a movie when you were going to the theater. And then we have some other activities for you. So here's a newspaper template. Uh, so you can put some pictures here, write some articles, make up your newspaper title, and you can put like where it's from and how much you wanna charge for your paper. Um, so you can write an article about World War II, like a battle, or maybe you wanna focus on particular people like the Welch and Taylor, the two American pilots that we talked about yesterday. And then we have some other suggestions for some at-home activities you can do, um, like reenacting a fireside chat or creating your own newsreel or radio broadcast about a battle like Midway or the attack on Pearl Harbor. Maybe you wanted to write or share about um, these home front activities and how life has changed. But also there are some similarities between the wartime home front and what we're seeing happen in America right now. So if you wanted to make it more about what's happening today, you could always do a newsreel about that and maybe share some encouraging words for uh, 
our doctors and nurses or people who work in grocery stores, truck drivers, or maybe you want to create one where you share some encouraging words with your classmates and your teachers as you continue to transition to online learning. And we would love to see the things that you guys are creating. So if you make one of these and you want to upload them to social media, you can tag our museum, Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, in your post, as well as the World War II Museum and World War II Education. And go ahead and use the hashtag Pearl Harbor at home. We would love to engage with you guys and maybe even share some of your creations on our social media as well. So I think, oh, and you can find all these resources on our website and in the comments below this video as well. Well, thank you, Ford and Melissa. And like Melissa said, our museums hope to see you guys using these resources. So make sure that if you're doing them at home, you're sharing them out and letting the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum know. And with that, we have a lot of questions coming in. And so I'm gonna start with actually a really good one um, from Ashley. And she wants to know, so what were the long-term cultural impacts of World War II on Hawaii? Well, let me, let me try and answer that. Um, unlike uh, the mainland, um, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, things changed drastically. Um, and as I mentioned earlier in, in those, uh, those photos, you know, um, gas masks were issued, um, gun emplacements were set up in anticipation of a possible invasion. Uh, and because of martial law, um, the, the military government was in total control of the Hawaiian Islands a uh, number of years. And that military control affected uh, civilian population immensely. Uh, so again, um, not just adult civilians, but the youth, the kids were severely impacted because of uh, martial law and because of what happened at Harvard. Well, thanks Ford. And this, this next question from John actually kind of goes in line with that. He wants to know, were Japanese Americans in Hawaii incarcerated like they were on the West Coast in World War II? Uh, that's an awesome question. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, we, we had the situation where um, a lot of um, Japanese Americans were uh, interred in concentration camps, but um, Hawaii was an exception. And the reason why Hawaii was an exception was because uh, a good majority of the workforce in Hawaii were Japanese Americans. And uh, even the military government uh, realized that if they attempted to incarcerate uh, this huge population of Japanese Americans from Hawaii, um, the infrastructure of Hawaii would totally collapse. And uh, so they realized they couldn't do that. There were a handful of um, uh, Japanese nationals and um, and some Japanese Americans that were incarcerated um, and those were usually people that had association with Japanese schools or Japanese uh, newspapers and like that. Thank you for that. And another question that just came in and you may be able to answer this, were the air raid shelters at schools in Hawaii, were they, were they filled in after the war? Were they used for something else? Do you, do you know? As, as far as I know, especially like those uh, air raid trenches that we saw in the picture at Lilikalani School, um, those were all filled in after the war. Um, and I'm pretty sure that most of the other um, air raid shelters in the school areas were all filled in and uh, but we still have air raid shelters throughout the islands that are still visible that were uh, that were used during the second world war and some of them are now used more for storage and things like that as opposed to it being used for its original design Wow. So your museum is on Fort Island and we talked a lot about this yesterday. So if you are watching and you missed yesterday's program with Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, we recorded it and you can find it on our YouTube. 
Um, can you find it on your site yet? Do you guys know? I'm not sure. Melissa? Um, not sure. <laughs> well, you can find it on our site and we'll post it again. We'll post the recording to both this one and yesterday's. Um, but we, are there remnants of the attack on Pearl Harbor and so other, other places other than Pearl Harbor and Fort Island? Oh, there, there are numerous other locations uh, throughout the island that still bears the scars of that December 7th morning. Um, most of them are on military installations. Um, like in the video, uh, they mentioned um, a building in Wheeler that had just been missed by a bomb and you could see the, the scarring on that particular building and the headquarters, Air Force headquarters on Hickam. Um, if you have an opportunity to, to visit that structure, uh, it is just totally pockmarked with battle damage from that December 7th morning. Oh, wow. So Amalia wants to know, were there kids in school during the attack and then did they go back to school right after the attack? Um, well, luckily, um, the attack on December 7th was a Sunday morning, so kids were, weren't in school. And I, I think we're, we can thank our lucky stars for that. Um, and un, when martial law was declared, um, there, just like now where things kind of, school kind of ceased for a moment, so they could gather their wits and, and figure out what to do. And um, the military government had to decide which schools they needed to conduct their operation. And so it took a little while uh, for them to determine which schools would continue to be open and which schools would be used for, by the military or for other purposes. But um, it, it took a, um, a while before they made that decision. But eventually the kids did go back to school. Just, just like us. We'll all go back to school, school soon, hopefully. And it looks like we've got time for one more question. And Salvador wants to know, was the impact the same of, on all the islands as it was on Oahu? Um, it was basically the same. Um, martial law applied to the entire uh, territory of Hawaii, um, but more so Oahu and only because the large military installations were all located on Oahu at the time. Uh, eventually, during the course of the war, um, military installations uh, were developed on the other islands, but the bulk of it were on Oahu at the time. Well, thank you, Ford and Melissa, for sharing all of your resources and knowledge about Pearl Harbor and the attack on December 7th. Um, we really appreciate you guys. We also really appreciate all of you out there watching, even though we had some technical difficulties. And again, I'm gonna leave it with Melissa sharing out um, the resources and the what she wants you guys to tag when you do your resources at the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum has for you guys. Yeah, so if you guys want to use those resources, you can find the links on the comments below and also on our websites. And then if you share them on social media, go ahead and tag Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum and the World War II Museum and World War II Education and use the hashtag Pearl Harbor at home so we can continue to engage with you. All right, thanks guys and happy Aloha Friday. I've got my Aloha shirt on, I hope everybody noticed. Aloha. Oh, thank you.